imagine it's over 500 probably. Welcome to the Poetry Project. I'm Kyle DeCoy and I'm the executive director here. And I'm really thrilled uh, that we have Aaron Markey and Eileen Miles reading tonight. Aaron Markey is going to read first, uh, then we'll take a little bit of a break, and Eileen Miles will read. And I'm going to hand things over to Max Steele, who will introduce Aaron. I met Aaron Markey when we were shot boys at a gay bar, at a new gay bar in Williamsburg called Sugarland, because of its proximity to the old Domino Sugar Factory. Before it was Sugarland, it was a straight bar called Capone's because the antique wooden bar was from a place that Al Capone liked to go to. Capone's was a pizza bar where if you buy a beer, they give you a pizza. When Sugarland opened, they used the kitchen as a coat check and there was still a pizza oven and sacks of flour and mozzarella cheese and industrial containers of red sauce back there. I share this image because it for me, starts to illustrate the deep thrill of Aaron Markey's work, the trapdoor feeling of discovery. The pleasure of Aaron's work is how rewarding their language is, a simultaneous punchline and heartbreak. Aaron is like the star quarterback and the head cheerleader, the football and the mascot. They are like gay sugar and mobster pizza. Their work teaches us that we don't have to choose between tragedy and comedy romance, horror, fear, and fantasy, between genres, positions, or families, between the past or the future. Or rather, I should say that Aaron's work teaches us that we don't have to choose just once. We can keep choosing and keep choosing over and over again, that it's up to us, that we surprise the world by living in it, that we outdo ourselves by showing up. Aaron's work pulls this bravery out of the air and makes a balloon animal with it, their work shows us that if we need to, there will be more new words, new language that can be cruised, excuse me, cruised into collaboration with us. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Markey. Um, thank you, Max. I feel like I want that to be the piece. <laughs> but instead, I'll do a new piece that um, is going to be really brief and not very showbiz, because that's my new brand. <laughs> mm. Okay. which just means that I am ruined. That I'm a hunting lodge on fire, the one my dad built with his brothers and Uncle Dick, who I'm not related to, that burnt down a few years ago. We have home movies of them building it these identical mustaches in rubber coveralls drilling two by fours and day drinking natural light. It's sick to love the smell of natural light on a mustache, but I get it done because it's my job. The ants are sometimes in the shot with the toddlers and the Cool Ranch Doritos. When my mom would make lunch, 
She would usually put purple grapes in the smallest compartment of this marbled plastic plate that was square. This plate was probably a predecessor to Instagram, which has owned the concept of the square for like eight years now. <laughs> but who cares? It was the kind of plate we ate off in the fenced-in part of our yard where the swing set was. I wanted to be capable of an underdog so fucking bad. That's where your cousin pushes you harder and harder on the swing until you're so high, your cousin can run all the way under your butt. She has to run without hesitation all the way under your butt so your butt doesn't slam into her head when gravity kicks in. I'm making it sound fun and safe, but people could die. <laughs> I knew that. And I wasn't the kind of kid who was willing to die on a swing set. Crossing the street, sure. There's no way to keep track of that many drivers coming towards you. My strategy at a crosswalk was then and still is close my eyes, walk forward, and give my body to the street. If the grill of a truck needs to get involved, let it. But you can keep track of a cousin. I repeat, you can keep track of a cousin. I was younger than her by about a decade. She was on homecoming court. We have home movie footage of her doing all the rituals of it, but a babysitter of ours spilled white wine on the VHS tape and it garbled the sound. So my dad dubbed the song Chariots of Fire over the top <laughs> instead of whatever was there in the bleachers. Chariots of Fire was the theme song of the 1988 Olympics in Seoul. I watched this VHS a lot. I loved having a cousin in the Olympics. <laughs> in the video, my cousin is wearing a 16 Candles era pink puff sleeved T-length gown sitting on the trunk of a convertible, her satin heels poking into the leather of the back seat. I can't confirm that it was leather. Going seven miles an hour. They're circling the track that orbited the football field. She's waving like Parker Posey as Jackie O in the movie The House of Yes. In that movie, Parker Posey's character and her twin brother have this role play game that they are both addicted to. They pretend to be the Kennedys in the convertible right before and during when John F. Kennedy takes a bullet and then they fuck. These characters have been addicted to the game for a long time. The brother tries to remove himself from the addiction cycle by marrying Tori Spelling. But on a stormy Thanksgiving night, the twins can't help but play again. But this time, Parker Posey, understanding profoundly that her twin was really going to stop playing, puts real bullets in the gun, shoots him, and he dies. But anyways, my cousin was on the basketball team <laughs> as well as homecoming court. Kind of a tomboy, a soft butch. She's married to a cop now. She wasn't a homecoming queen. She was on homecoming court. There's a difference. It means you're a little more accessible. <laughs> she had a perm and a waterbed and she wore a perfume called ex cla me shun <laughs> The bottle was in the shape of a fat black exclamation point. The first time I had an orgasm, that shape appeared to me while I came. <laughs> I didn't will it, it was a surprise. It appeared in a psychological slideshow of images that my brain clicked through. All short squat things, like a hamburger, a cupcake, a peach, a Charlie Chaplin hat, and then the exclamation point. 
<laughs> As I got closer and closer to my first orgasm, the exclamation point got fatter and fatter <laughs> until it exploded, which is the most exclamation point kind of thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> I really have a handle on grammar that way. In the fourth grade, I won the class spelling bee on the word grammar. Nobody could get that last A. They were doing stuff like G-R-A-M-M-E-R and G-R-A-M-M-U-R. I'm the one that got the A at the end. I was the new girl in school. So it was incredible to have that kind of platform. <laughs> and the platform just got bigger and bigger. I won the school spelling bee on the word bountiful. And then I won the regional fourth grade spelling bee on the word thief. It was South Carolina, so you could win on easy words. <laughs> With me, you can always win on easy words. I like monosyllabic stuff, especially during dirty talk, but I'm a populist that way. Academic language annoys me. All those prefixes and suffixes need to please keep their voices down in the library. Makes me think of that Coco Chanel quote, before you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one thing off. I wore a black mesh mini dress once to the cock and entered a buck contest. I won. The prize was a fleshlight, which is a toy orifice. <laughs> the fire that burnt down the hunting lodge was ultimately an upgrade. The insurance covered it, and a whole new house was built without them. It had regular house stuff inside of it. They didn't have to pee in an old paint bucket anymore. I know that the shed where they kept the three-wheelers went up in flames too. And that means that all the ripped out Playboy centerfolds tacked to the walls of blondes with taut pink labia lips also burned. It makes me think of Judd Fry's shed. Judd Fry is the dirty farmhand who's one of the people in love with the ingenue in Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. It's on Broadway right now. Judd is normally the villain, has a sort of rapey vibe, but in this version, they complicate it a bit. I should have been cast as Judd. That said, I turned down the role of Captain Hook last summer to play Wendy. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. We're just gonna roll into it. The page in my journal that says notes for Eileen Miles just reads peanut butter, Diet Coke, Pit Bull, New York, Marfa, President. And I look at it and think, well, this isn't very good of me. Eileen Miles has already said everything beautiful, tender, dirty, and necessary about all of this, and what use is the recap? But I am also deeply invested, as I think we all are, in the circuitry of Eileen Miles' curiosity, which is to say their ardor. There's no decoration in the work. Everything is always moving. And the cohering gets figured out the faster it all goes, because the words and objects, all of them, are heading to this new front and center place of attention, and then making way for the next and the next. There's this wildly loving, hurting, feeling quality that gets ahead of any self-consciousness or permission and just goes. Eileen Miles is a Sagittarius. 
They are also the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Andy Warhol Creative Capital Arts Writers Grant, four Lambda Book Awards, the Shelley Prize from the Poetry Society of America, and a Poetry Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts. They are also the former artistic director of the Poetry Project, a novelist, memoirist, art journalist, photographer. I think we should all be taking their Instagram practice seriously. And of course I have to say poet. And of course I also have to say presidential candidate because after all, Eileen Miles' 1992 presidential campaign did include a 28 state tour, some great oration, several MTV appearances, and the announcement of their campaign inspired Zoe Leonard's poem, I Want a President. And if we have to have a president of the United States, I guess we do, I just think a poet is frankly more qualified than a reality television personality. I guess maybe we could sit with this word president a little longer. And I'm not just thinking about the last line in an American poem. There definitely is something presidential about Eileen Miles, at least in the way I want to be thinking about presidential. There is total comfort there, and honestly, a sense of populace and leveling and benevolence. They've always been writing about economic inequity, public housing, Palestine, healthcare. At least among poets, I'm like, Eileen Miles has a plan for that. I went through our archive the other day and found in issue 108 of the Poetry Project newsletter Eileen's first message as artistic director here, which begins, quote, the mad reign of Pope Eileen in 1984. Today I'm all for such splashy entitlements as posters on the streets, rah-rah Poetry Project, and moving the Wednesday series into the sanctuary of St. Mark's, since we're in a church, we should use it. They go on. Being a poet is an odd, low-paying vocation like a saint. I think the most magnificent saints in the course of doing it for themselves found someone who was watching. I'm really sick of being accused or of accusing myself of practicing a second-rate art form, feeling obliged to do it to music or in front of a screen so I can get people to look. They're looking. Don't worry, I'm into poem essence. They'll smell it from the street and come in. It's that kind of optimism that I just find really bracing. And it isn't naive at all, it's really kind of weathered. From the first titular poem in this new book, Evolution, quote, I want to go further longer. And from the poem, What Tree Am I Waiting? The first in there selected. I came here to hold the hurt like a bird like a tree, traffic has rings. We watch it whirl around, damaging our night. Great continents hold the feelings and the ages. Something I completely forgot until this moment in writing Eileen Miles' introduction is that the first poetry reading I went to in New York when I moved here four years ago was from Boston was here in this room for the launch of that book, I Must Be Living Twice, which coincided with the reissue of Chelsea Girls. It was a lot like this. There were people on the floor and you could just feel poem essence. And I left the f reading feeling really like, wow, this is why I moved to New York because there's this poetry church where people get on the ground for poetry. And so I left the reading and then made my way an avenue over to have a first date with someone who I've ended up staying with, even though I really didn't want to have a boyfriend at the time. Um, someone who incidentally introduced Aaron Markey a little bit ago. And I say that because that's how reading Eileen Miles' poems makes me feel. You could be walking around Second Avenue and because the poems make your attention buzz in this new way, you could just totally accidentally fall in love with someone. So I hope you look around because it might be a special night for you too. <laughs> and please join me now in welcoming Eileen Miles to the Poetry Project.
Kyle, that was so great. God. Hi, you guys. Hey. <laughs> it's like hot in here, right? It's sort of, um. So, I don't know. I think I was picturing this in the other room and thinking I was going to, I'm going to read mostly new work and maybe a f couple of poems from here. But I'm feeling sort of quiet, but I think that's okay, right? But I, f I figured out, the most amazing thing I figured out in my life lately, which is, I have two problems. One, that I give a lot of money to, um, well, I give money to, really to two things, to Palestine and to animal groups. So it's always dog town. You get you, all these things tumbling out of your mailbox, and it's like, okay, you know, horses, donkeys. And so then they all give you calendars. <laughs> and then I just feel like there's all these adorable animal cal I mean, how many calendars can you have in your life? But I've also had the problem of what to put my poems in, and I just figured out cat animal calendars. <laughs> so it's just like the absolute. So it's it's totally working out. Because <laughs> oh. I even have new spots in my apartment that's just like a a spot on the floor for an animal calendar. Because I think, you know. Where else am I going to put that calendar? Oh, this is going to get weird because we'll see with the poem. The first poem is called Lucky Kittens. <laughs> it's got to be from one of, one of those calendars. Okay. Um. Lucky Kittens. I met, some, I met something cool. I met something cool and I can't shake it. I want to write a poem to the new thing. Nothing more trans than taking a shit in the men's room in a hotel. Also, I had a perfect breakfast and am well. I exercised all good things. And once again, I'm flying. A world without mother is a world without meat. I'm not crying, I'm flying. Honestly, I took my mother's tear from the corner of her eye. It happened when she died. I took it on my finger and I wiped it on my jeans. The rattling of paper is an exquisite disconnect old-fashioned, all breaks, making space, always ready for a fight. My heat is instantly shadowy, like a moving hand or sound, like no jazz at all. So this one, this one I wrote, you know that day where there was like a snowstorm that like was so not a snowstorm and the whole city canceled everything and then nothing happened? So this is either called March 3rd or snow, but it's like snow, like S apostrophe, N-O-W, so it's more like snow. Because <laughs> that's kind of what happened. The quick exchange of emails between the former lovers creates a soft hole in the day and the night before. It snowed, but it was supposed to be larger, and everything's closed. The streets are wet, I hear, and I won't step into them. One poem for today, but no, many little ones. The coffee slightly altered is good, my bare feet in bed ready to work. I work in the field of dreams where I have met you many times. I feel closer to you this morning and probably last night when the doorway slightly opened because of our notes it was flooded with ghosts. When I was young, I liked the emptiness of my home, and now, like it or not, here is this sweet accumulation. The cameras, all that everything I do can't touch the single statement of breeze and loss and quaint beauty, things I've had since I was a kid, the secrets of my home. I feel condemned by this chaotic museum of stuff, and yes, I desire to photograph it, the bowls you liked, the cup you touched, and me in a t-shirt that used to be special, and now I carouse in bed with myself in it. I don't know if this will ever be different, and that is the feeling of this. I feel like a tree, the invisible part of friendship and drinking together and warning. One empty wall is the least I can do for myself. Late at night, I enjoy the brown pages. This is a dead wood reference. I I'm so glad it's coming back. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, fuck Game of Thrones. I'm like, dead wood. I enjoy the brown pages of a cowboy show TV on my lap till practically dawn. Interesting, written by a gambler. Oh, I have so many shows, one in Florence one day, you were taking a shower, I think I thought, I love this television. 
because it's become the way to love, the road of becoming is a screen belonging on it in my dream. The excellent moments, the man barges in and says, do you ever think about film? The poetry of accident haunts like a circus tent over my days, and that fades in a new one. I begin to write about dying. This story ends. It begins to be part of the plot. And do I love you for your distance from it? Or could I love you because you are close or your exciting difference so smart? I love myself. The squeaky little voice that says, in here, owning the void and grooving on it. Voice over, you're not so bad. And then I begin to work. My dead mother is around, my lover not far, keeping you here by not calling anyone. Is that the tub in which I die? Where do, woo, 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 what's that bird? Because I don't have kids, and this is such a blessing. Mm. Thank you. Um, this is called The Trip, and I have to, I do have to plug something because I made a little 17-minute film with, um, with, a, with a filmmaker and Marfa David Finster, and it's like a puppet road film, and if you're interested, um, you just follow me on Instagram, and it's in the bio, the link, and you can go see it on YouTube, because otherwise I'll stop the poem and plug it during the poem, so I'll just get, but it's called The Trip. I shall miss you. Drinking grass like that, a creature drinks from a stream its time and they feel their own trickle and warmth and wonder, what's that to know? My own, hug some, how the language slipping the moon drink twice, once in my throat and once in my eyes, it's a new year. How about it, is sleep better than death, is day better than night, is love better than eternity, are dogs better than cats, is coffee, what is coffee? Any groaning machine better than any chirping animal? Is a child better than a building? Is an unseeing woman better than not? Is heat better than ice cold day, bright day, better than telling the truth? Is truth the ugly thing you share? Is sharing beautiful or hurtful and cruel? Does a pen have words in any event endless? Are words like bullets tearing flesh announcing themselves? What do they tell? Do hurtful words tell the end of something? The body always cold. The day was never new. Life is a prison. How are you? Drinking that, saying that, writing that, the puppets groan, the heating clanks, it's open to you. A box or a vista, a plate of cheese. Hmm. For my friend. Nothing better for people than dogs. Nothing better than making you scream here. There were two super new cars and then some pink chicken fillets. I guess there were berries for sale in Scandinavia, a man in a plaid shirt and cookies. Also, they are working in the cemetery. I can see their blue ladder from here. A man has written a book about many deaths or many things to do after. Read it, read it, they say. But what comes after is a small idea. Now is large, rainy. Amy, I wish you luck. Aaron, amazing. That was so, I, I was just like, I so wanted it to keep going forever, but that's just like the greatest tribute, right? Um, you're, so, you're so smart. And I, I had this idea that you were from Boston, and I was so excited to say that I was the only person in New York that could say your name correctly, Aaron Mackey. <laughs> but you're not from Boston, so I was just like, what good is that joke? I was like, <laughs> um. So this is called First Poem. It was the first poem in a relationship, and I sent it to her, and she was like, eh. I was like, oh no. I was like, then later she was like, no, no, it's good. It was just like, we were all. Every experience of being and day awakens me to the difficulty. I change my socks, I see my feet. You don't so much mind my flaws, I think, at the world when I go out. Women in chairs and couch, one of both, a tender dog and actual tears. Today it snows, we go live. It was our first fight. It was, it was, 
This one's called Tasha. She prefers my phone and using my computer without the burden of her life. Last night I described it open, a circle. She kisses my knee. It's life that is my name. They thought she had a lot. I think it's enough. I mean, it's astonishing. If I had his, I could feel everything. But as it is, I know what it is. I love your lips. To love. Do you only go to new places? Is it true? Did the planet just get born? You and your little e you and your little legs and I and my tree am love. The baby crying is the bouncing plane, the strange wind that killed Bob. All of it is true, and I in my rot am having the time of my life. Okay, this one this is a total dis departure and potentially really fucked up, but I'm gonna read it. Um, it was actually some, a, a Spanish magazine, somebody had written something for before in Spain, asked me for something about archives. And um, I had one thought, but I thought I could never publish this anywhere, but I could publish it in Spain because nobody will ever read it. And, because it wasn't gonna be translated, it was strictly in Spanish. And then something happened, like the woman's mother died and they never published it. And then somebody asked me to do, be in a reading series called Unpublishable. And I thought, what would that be? And then I thought, oh, this. And so it's called My Secret. You'll see what it's, it's. As of fall 2017, I am interred in the Beinecke collection at Yale. What that means is that all of my notebooks since age 10 are now being sorted and filed and made available to some part of the researching public. On the occasion of, occasion of being interred, I read at Yale this fall, and next fall I will give a talk entitled How to Write. When I gave the reading at Yale, I stayed at a hotel called The Study at Yale. I drove, so I handed the keys to my car to the valet, and I didn't see it again for a couple of days. I was tired, having driven that morning from Newark Airport. I had left my car there for a few days while I read someplace else in the US, and now I had driven here. But still, this Yale reading didn't feel like a regular gig, but more like the portraits I saw in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, actually in the cool climate-controlled basement of the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the 90s. When I was doing research for a play, I was writing about the poet nun of New Spain, Sir Juana Inez de la Cruz. The museum had a portrait that was a copy of the only known portrait of her. I wanted to look at it. But to get to it, they first rolled out several other portraits of young women with piles of flowers on their heads and white dresses. These were wedding portraits of women who were entering the convent, and their portraits had been painted because they would never again be seen by their families. They were each marrying God, or maybe a building, the convent. Secretly, they were marrying each other. So I felt a little that way about the reading at Yale the entire enterprise. I was marrying Yale, or my papers were, or my writing history was. This was the beginning of the end. I read in a very beautiful room on the second floor of the library. It was a building made out of very thin marble. Light came in from outside, but not that much light. It was thin stone, so it was a little bit like being buried alive. There was a nice big audience there, all friendly and happy to see my burial. I think, Sure, many of them might have thought I was just reading rather than truly understanding what was behind the ritual. I read from all over my poetry life, young poems, recent ones. My selected poems had come out a few years ago, so I was used to reading from old work, but this was different. Now I wanted to do a full, a good full scan of the corpse. People liked it, and afterwards I went out with some of the archivists and can't, is this too weird? Is it a little weird? I went out with some of the archivists and Karen, who was John Ashbery's biographer. I knew John, but she did too, but differently. She knew John. What hell to be a biographer, but I guess what purgatory it is to be me. Part and teared, the rest still alive and creating more fodder to be placed in folders filed away to be installed. I love the archivists. They were all smart and weird and spoke about the archivist before them who were really weird. <laughs> one in a likable way and one in a very mean, unlikable way. They talked about no matter how much scholars read about a poet, 
And this archive is mainly poets. It's a poet's graveyard. What researchers really want to know is who the poet fucked or what the poet fucked, probably how they fucked. And you know, honestly, it's one of the main things I write about in my notebooks. My fucking, my needing to fuck, my needing to stop fucking. And I continue to keep notebooks. It's how I started writing, and it's really nothing but ironic. I had no space in my life as a child. It's the trauma of my life. I had a lovely sunny room when I was a child, and then my sister was born, and I was moved across the hall to a larger, dark, shared room. My bright room sat over there across the hall from the new dark shared one for as long as I lived in the house, but now it held my brother, a boy. He had the sun, he had the privacy. Nothing much happened in there in my life for 10 years, and then I was given a greasy black insurance company diary. It had a moose head on the cover in gold, and it said 1960, and I began. It was my place. In about five years, I went for the first time in my life on a vacation with my aunt and her family, and neither my sister nor my mother nor my brother came. My dad was already dead. It was just me and my aunt and my cousins. I had my own room, and my room didn't have a good reading lamp, but the hall did, so the room was largely for lying naked on my bed like I had never done before in my life. And the hall was for me sitting under the overhead light, with my latest little diary, say 1963, so only three years later, not five, and I would write my life into it. I didn't have sex yet, but when there was sex, boom, there, onto these pages it would go. And I've been pouring for years. Nobody's gonna ask the archivist if I had sex or who I had sex with. I just received a galley in the mail from a young writer who admires my work. In fact, in the galley, they describe me as their hero. But they are, in fact, researching the writer Carson McCullers. The writer of the galley is a lesbian, and so she believes Carson McCullers is also one, and so she has been reading her letters and transcriptions of her therapy sessions and pieces of her mostly redacted memoir, all in search of the evidence that Carson McCullers is, in fact, a lesbian. That wouldn't be the problem with me. <laughs> I'm so obviously a lesbian, I don't even call myself a lesbian anymore. I say queer or trans. I say they, but none of that matters. There just is no sexual mystery. The researchers will just be sitting there turning the pages of my composition notebooks, hundreds of them, 57 years of them, and say I started having sex in 1965. Did I start writing about it yet? I guess there are some questions. My father died in 1961 and I did not write about that. Guess I just didn't think it was worthy of mention. But I suspect I began to write about sex at some point. And then it was just blatantly clear for years. I was having it, I wasn't having it, it was good, it was lousy. We were breaking up, there was no one. There was someone new, on and on for years. If I've made it so easy, what would they be re researching? My work? <laughs> the last woman I dated made me promise I wouldn't write about her. I'm sure she meant, don't write about having sex with me. I said, no, of course. Then I said, well, there's actually only one way I can really make that promise. The joke was that I only write about people after we break up. So if she stayed with me forever, no problem. <laughs> but that isn't true. I was always writing about her in my notebook. And people will be sitting at a table at Yale reading about her. Somehow that makes me more comfortable than thinking of people turning page after page of my sex life and my sadness, my ambition, and my shame. I like thinking that I'm betraying someone else in the future with my notebook rather than the more depressing thought that I'm betraying myself. I begin writing to have some space, some privacy, and the end result is that all those years of thoughts and desires and worries and feelings being baldly open to the world, overly na naked like that first bedroom I was in, Anybody that can flash a university ID or a flimsy cover letter from some journal can sit down and be slightly amused and disgusted by my sex life for years. In fact, they can do that while I'm still alive. I'm hoarding the last couple of years. It feels just like being alive. By being alive and still writing, I'm hoarding. This most recent ex could conceivably go and read about herself if I allow the current notebooks to enter into the crypt with my name on it. But I will not do that. But it doesn't feel the same anymore. The dirty kick of being alone is gone. Sitting on the plane, writing into my black and white composition notebook, I could really give a shit if the person next to me is reading what I write over my shoulder. 
I'm already writing now as if someone is reading me. Why not that Claude right there? I had imagined when I thought about writing this piece about archives that I would pop some of my current journal in right here, just like a little trailer for my dead future. The girlfriend before the most recent ex was actually very excited about being in Yale. She loved that that was where our love would go. I hadn't even sold my archive to them yet and she was thrilled. It was like she was already in the future in the crypt, more excited about being there with me than the me here we shared a couple of years ago. There was this very beautiful picture she gave me of herself as a young mother nursing her child. There was this big tit the kid was sucking on. And interestingly, those tits had been reduced, actually discarded before I ever met her. And I never met those tits. She gave me that photo and I gave that to Yale. Ha, huh, I thought. <laughs> I'll give them your tits. The more secrets are theirs, somebody else's, not mine, the better I feel about the whole thing. And yet something is hidden. What could it be? I will never breathe a word. Oh. Okay. That's Actually, maybe I better go backwards for a second to get back into the present. Um, what am I going to read? <laughs> Ask the cats. I had a little list, but I don't know where it is. Yeah, this is called um, The City for Alana, A. Alana. The city is juicy and bloody at night. My dog is in it, I think that's why I'm reading it. The city is juicy and bloody at night, stabbing my eyes, an orange dog walking through a town of dead leaves with the green stripe of chicken smell off, on. Occupy invented the city at night. All its empty wares are everywhere. Now, now is a wide cement path. I love when she performs that orange stripe madly again and again in the house. She likes inside her cage and she likes out. There is water everywhere when the, wa when the bottom drops out. Oh, mammal, you are my love. My loneliness, an illustrious path, a screen. I shoot these themes. Themes. I mean my jism, that look on your face is covered with my thought. I might stop for a while, a long while now, then again I may not. This is the big machine and we are in it. Occupy ruined everything, the city is gone. The meat, trups, the meat trucks cry. In this chalice, in this cherished empty bell, capitalism gnawing on its bone, its bloody, blazing, empty bone, its porny, plastic bone, and no one's home. I scrawl on your wall how many mill buildings paid for with skulls, the girls who were stolen and married, spent, the boys who were burned, they are living in your rooms, your clothes, asshole, are theirs. Actually, it's hard to get into the past. Um, it's not even that far past, but... I'll read one more of these. No, I'll read it. This is my poems. My poems are so much like the city, they couldn't publish them on the train. I guess I'm glad to be back in this. <laughs> right? I could stop complaining about poetry in motion. I just write a poem about it. Oh whatever they call it. I'm, I guess I'm glad to be back in this relationship. It's not my old phone, but it has the same. I just need to be sensitive to what's riding under, really roiling the bitch while I'm riding on the train. Nobody knows me, the way my faces change, the vocabulary of me. If I had a million stickers and the date that poet died thinking while he lived, he was hitting on students, playing barefoot man in the winter in a car. If this is my Valentine, I better also get a treat. There's no news. The whole city thinking flowers and fruit. I am standing on the platform. A man blows his nose. He means I love you. Her boots do. The world is never superfluous. Second Ave is just enough. Thanks. And 
one more of these. This one's called transmission. My mother died a couple of years ago, and I'm, I mean, I'm kind of obsessed. It's like your mother, your mother dying doesn't like end. And there was this great, that great book about trees, you know, Peter, somebody wrote it, Peter, and it was like how trees have communities, and you realize that trees, trees in the city actually have no community. They absolutely, because the, the, uh, like a natural forest, all the roots are connected, and if, if, a, if a tree gets hurt, it communicates to all the other trees that there's a predator, and it's, you know, and the mother tree stops the tree from growing. It's so weird, and, the, and trees can only grow to a certain point, and then the mother has to die so that the tree can shoot up. So awesome with my mom dying. I mean, I needed that, you know? It's transmission. I'm overcome by the cruelty of nature. No, I mean, I'm with it, and each little capacity it has can't be transferred. I mean, a spruce can't give its oil to you, can it? But that's how it grows in the absence of technology. My thoughts grow, my thoughts grow among trees, but I don't help them, though I'm for them. I'm for my dog, and incidentally, I feed her, but I don't see her much. Joe does. Joe is my friend and also a dog father. I don't help mountains. Mountains help me. I know the planet is old and splashy. Sleep helps me. Time helps me. My mother helped me, and now she is gone. She also hurt me, so it's good that she's gone. I can grow different in the day or three decades in which I've got left. I can grow towards the mountains, sit in solidarity with prisoners, or go to jail. I'm not joking. I can push different. I want to say something about my cunt, because that's what you ask. But I am alone. No mother, no phone, just a notebook and a cunt in my thoughts. I don't even think my thoughts. You do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read a few more of these new ones and then, and then everybody can go and drink and eat pizza. Oh, this is, okay, I thought, I read um, this poet friend of mine, Sally, gave me the, um, the pillow book. Have you read the pillow book? It's like one of the most awesome books in the world. And, and I just was so deeply, I, th I thought, and I wrote this poem after that, and I thought, this is completely different because of that book. And I think it isn't different at all, but I felt that it was. So it's called Pigs. It is the first day, because she's so formal about her, her existence, and I thought, this is so formal, but I think it's the same thing I always do. Pigs. It is the first day of the new year. The city honors this day by not requiring us to move our cars. I ran down in flip-flops, then I looked at the app and discovered this fact. I said hi to my neighbor and stumbled up the stairs. Are you okay, she said. Yes, I said, but I felt not ashamed, but must, rattled. I started reading The New Yorker, which seemed so in between. I said so on Twitter, and one woman started flirting with me. I had showed my address in a photo of the magazine, and it sounded like she would be right over. I said I had six kids and my husband was a brute. My friend in Chicago laughed. <laughs> you know? Was... Right? That's the thing about, we're sort of always on social media, right? You just, um, okay, this is called Russia. I read a book and then I want to read another one about Russia, about the bathtub. I think Russia's too much like me, dry and cruel. Blue, wild, cerebral, dour. The poets there have been brainwashed by the team of white poets preceding me, who explained that in America, everything is confessional except them. My intention was to muddle through my reading, not muddle, but wander, explain how I like a mind, like a spaciousness that hungers for more and can get lost inside your thereness for days. You're like, hmm, okay. This one is extremely New York school. It's called Everything. The pizza shop had a bottle labeled Everything, so delightedly I shook it on my pizza and jumped into a cab. I'm old school New Yorker. I told Adam I liked the inexactness of cabs, the cash, the entire analog experience of them. The details of the Joe and Charlie visit is fading. I told him about lunch with Gail, but not everything. The quote she gave me, I used in our conversation in chairs, in front of people, was perfect. Is this? 
Here it is, la chance dans la malchance, and by now sirens, the exact act of goodness in life is often situated in the bad, the wrong, the pizza no longer warm. By the time I get home, but Adam, I have to get off so now I can eat it. And I remember the cold coffee in the refrigerator. That's where the traveling mug is. I open the door and then I close it. To sleep, you have to stop that stuff sometime. And my toe throbs from dropping the kryptonite lock on it. And I am not going to Europe. Yes, I am. I am going to London next week, so quaint and dark, not like, not like us. And that is where the good chance is, in the bad forcing the thought to camp and finish the slice, like Frank or Charles Bukowski. No. Okay. Guys, you get trapped into that clapping thing, and then you're like, <laughs> you don't know who you are anymore. I was like, I have two more poems to read, but one I don't see, and I really have to find it. It's this. I know, this is, this is when I need a roadie. It's like, <laughs> this is the break moment. You're gonna tell me I have a cigarette and I'll still be looking for it. Pardon me? And where is the backpack? Um, in front of me. I don't know what, come and help me, where are you? Huh? Show me exactly what you mean. Oh, wait, wait, oh, you're, oh, I'm incredible. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk afterwards, right? Thank you, yeah, you're so great, okay. That's so nice. Okay, so this is called September 7th. It's got the worst beginning of any poem I ever wrote, but you'll see. The vagina of my life is so stretched out. That's not my, but it's just like, it's a metaphor. It's complete. I thought, where am I? Hundreds of my students landed in Brooklyn like we did last night, but it was another church. I saw the fear in their faces as I was climbing the gates and demanding we make the next connection. It was an old church. The congregation was, this is a dream. The old congregation was various, ecstatic. Yes, that's what, this is a, Little, crazy, lost, poor, everyone, they needed an assignment. When did we last meet? When do we do it again? Is this just sentimental? Am I the priest? Describe the congregation, that's what I'll ask. It was a little like Kalandia. The churches were trains, they were nations, homeless, they were, pu they were punishment, we seem to gather here. Describe us, that's the only hope. Why are we out? Why aren't we home? No, it's us, and I know you very well. You seem to be following me. I brought you here. What do I want? It's cityless. It's godless. It's fatherless. It's motherless. It always feels the same, meeting at monuments, God asking for something, maybe. I lost my notebook. My computer died. I, sm I smell like fear. I didn't get any sleep. I wanted to be here. I couldn't keep watching that show. I finished the book about trees. Everything's stone in the name of God, but it's just us, pointless at night. I'm not really at the helm. I can't be blamed. Did I ask you here? I just woke up like everyone in this swarm. It's my disease that I think I'm responsible, that it's a class. It's not a reading. I'm not in charge. I said, over there, think, think, give them a purpose. Why did you come here tonight? Tell me what you see. Tell me who we are, what we want. Come back here again next week or sometime. Show me what you did. Only the shrink asked if I said this to everyone. What did I say? Am I saying it now? Is that why we're here? Tell me next week, next month, next year. I'll send a mailing tomorrow. You'll know when to come. I'll know who you are. I won't forget anyone. And if I seem like I would always be there, well, it just isn't true. You know, at a certain point, you hate the theme song, but you have to go on. This is after that. This is next. What did he like? I guess everyone's asking you that now. What do I like? All of us out there at night, not even looking for God, looking for religion, not even that, looking at churches, meeting there, looking back to see what I want. You can make me choose. It's not that I have a purpose. It's more like I don't want you to think that I don't have one. It's not that I don't have sex, don't like it. I forget where it happens. I can fix that. I can start while I travel, just having a little bit with everyone. The next time I see you all. <laughs> now, okay. now, one more. Okay. okay, so this is my finale. And I was in, um, Chelsea Girls got translated into Swedish, so I went to Sweden for a week and I did a Swedish tour. And so it was so weird. 
I went to three cities, but it looked like four cities because there was Gothenburg and then Gottborg. But it turned out that one is the English translation of the other, and Gottborg, when you say it in Swedish, is Gerebore, like that, which I'm sort of proud of. So the name of this poem is Gerebore. <laughs> and it's dedicated to Daphne and Alice. And they were, uh, so, I, so I did this reading, it was kind of like a, um, a gay, literary festival was the last reading I did and um, and then they had like an Eileen Miles after party and it was in this it was the greatest thing in the world it was like in this community ho house that was like a community center and all these lefty things went in there and um, the sweetest thing was that there was um, there was a bar and the bar was I told I was told the bar was run by um, newcomers and what it meant it was so incredible what it meant was that these guys were ref gay refugees and so they, um, this community just completely took them in, you know, and, and there was a bar and every time you bought a drink, it just went to these guys. So it was just like, they were the bartenders, but all the money was theirs and it was sort of incredible. But the poem is dedicated to Daphne and Alice and oh, I guess Alice was a lesbian folk singer and she sang folk songs in Swedish, it was kind of amazing. Um, but she said this thing to me at the beginning. She was like, um, when I saw a picture of you, I told my girlfriend, that's what I'm going to look like. <laughs> I was like, I thought, why is this about you? It was so weird. <laughs> and then later, I'm talking to this cute girl who tells me that she was, um, had been in ne upstate New York and had been Carol Lee Schneeman's assistant. And she said the first day she got to work, Carol Lee said, okay, first thing, we're going to take a nap. And it was like, that was her first day at work. She took a nap with Carol, Carol Lee Schneeman. I was like, and it turned out that was Alice's girlfriend, this one. Anyway, so here's the poem. Um, <laughs> I was like, came home and lost tons of consciousness. For a time, I stole trays from hotels, and now I steal cups. There was this towel I really wanted, Sweden nose towels. There was a shirt at the airport, white, sort of flocked, mine in every way except for this girth. I bought the girth a hamburger and nearly missed my plane. I ran and my heart pounded. I was not so fast. There was a man running with me. I yelled, 36, in camaraderie, but he ignored me, and then he started dropping shit. <laughs> I've been there. There's so much coffee. There's plenty of coffee. I wish someone was here. I'm becoming so sensitive. A person who has slept 10 hours, I'm like Vincent Price in anything. My soft voice whispering anything. There was a woman in my poem, no, I mean my dream, and she looked like someone I dated before. No, she felt like her, like she was going to be her, and it was an intense time in both of our lives. She was finishing something, and I was making a mountain of sleep. It was possibly crazy and she was humoring me, but I felt our gap about to be closed. It must be true. I thought, it feels this way, the two someones about to become us, this geological drama, tons of time manifest like persons. I was slowly heaving myself forward to close the small distance and I was struck in the dream by the fact she was anyone and I do this, make her mine, to share my coffee. It is better now, students. The coffee is good. It has become right for me in the day. And this is the relationship I wanted, the dark liquid waking me up in a stolen cup. Thank you, thank you. It's amazing to be up here around your poems. <laughs> I just talked to Carolee Schneeman's assistant today and she had also just woken up from a nap, <laughs> which is wild. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Aaron Markey and Eileen Miles. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got another event this Friday on translators introductions and then we've got uh, an anthology release that we're hosting a week from today with the Racial Imaginary Institute. So I hope you come back. Good night.